Hey folks, welcome to a special Zenny 62 on YouTube live. Uh, the lovely woman you're looking at is Tracy Birdsall, and she is a rogue warrior, rogue warrior, robot mm -hmm. fighter. And as I talk with everybody, what I'm doing right now, as many of the viewers who regularly tune in know, is I'm setting up the page, and I'm also setting up to where you can see um, not just her, but uh, so there, that is set up right there, uh, as you can see. And um, like so. So as I well, do as, and so yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> the next thing is we're gonna go to YouTube right now. Tracy can't quite see this and start the and start the uh, stream from the uh, perspective of the boom the events page. Actually, Tracy can see this. So um, yeah. And so now I'm going to mute myself. Actually, Tracy, you can't do that. Yeah. And which one has to do when you're on YouTube Live Mobile. And I'm going to put Tracy on as we commonly do. I'm going to give it the tweet out and the Facebook out. And we're wrapping up quickly here, which is great. There's the tweet. And there's a tweet on now. And then there's the Facebook. We'll put... Facebook on and say uh, get rid of that. I don't know why that always comes up on Fire Firefox. And we will put uh, live now. Exclamation Ow. point. Post to Facebook. Like so. And <laughs> there we go. It is posted to Facebook. And we're going to do one more tweet to get the Comic Con crowd. Hashtag STCC. Oh, I can't watch it while you're doing it. Hang on. Okay. Okay, cool. Because otherwise there's like a double voice going on. Oh, yeah, I'm used to the double voice. And then there's you over there. And then uh, we are over here. And I'm going to say hello all. And then say welcome, Tracy. You're used to the double voice. You're very talented, Jenny. Oh, oh, thank you so very much. <laughs> And we are rolling. Okay, cool. All right, Tracy. It's I'm great. I'm glad you're here. I'm gonna actually move the camera for my purposes closer to you to fill the screen like that. <laughs> and we'll get and what happens is that as people come in, we already got two thumbs up already, which is great. Uh, as people come in on the on my right, your right too, they're going to be posting questions, but I want to get more of your face so that they can see more of you and less of their own words, you know? Oh, then should I be watching this too, or I'll just take your prompt? Uh, you can just take my prompt. That's why I make it. The idea is to make it easy for you. You know what I mean? So, okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Tracy, tell my viewers how, what, what Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter is all about. Yeah. Okay. So it's, um, it's in the distant future, mm -hmm. and it's when humanity is being taken over by artificial intelligence, both on our world and on other worlds. And so Sienna, which is my character, is basically, um, she starts out as a one-man one -man army, and then she gathers her crew along the way, and it's how she goes out of the different worlds to find the, the weapons that will take them out and put an end to this. One of the nice things about Rogue Warrior that people don't expect is it's a character journey. Mm -hmm. So it's a genre within a genre. It's a character-driven science fiction film. Hmm. Now, Go Cub says, hi, Tracy. Go Cubs is one of our moderators and one of our consistent viewers. And uh, I want to know, first of all, how you came to be involved in making this film with... Because I met both of you all at Comic-Con. In fact, viewers watching can watch... My previous talk with Tracy and Neil about this on um, on YouTube, but this is fun because we get to talk more in depth about things. But I'm going to assume that people don't know about the film. So, how did you mm -hmm. get involved with this? Um, you met Marilyn Gigliotti too, remember? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, that's right. <laughs> it was one of those things where I'd met director Neil Johnson, and one day he'd said to me, "Hey, will you be this voice for this?" science fiction computer in a spaceship and it's on a prior project and as a complete and total sci-fi geek i was like i'm in right i felt like i was going to be hal or something and um so 
Um, I worked with him on that, and then I did a couple other voice things for him, and then I was winning awards in other films that I was doing, and he saw my commitment to my craft. And so he said, you know, we need to find a project that we can do together, and you can be my lead. And so we started tearing through scripts and stuff like that, finding something, because I like things with huge arcs and character. I like things I can jump in with both feet and kill myself on. And and, um, I grew up with an interest in robotics and science fiction. Of course, he grew up with science fiction. And um, so we settled on this one script, which, as we cast it, morphed into what is now Rogue Warrior. Wow. So you said morphed into. I know in one of the videos I interviews I saw of you in the is that you like to get into shaping a character. So describe yeah. Sienna as a character and how you came to how how much of Sienna is Tracy, and how much of Tracy is Sienna. You know, I like to think that. I'm not in my characters at all. I like to feel like I kind of embody them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you watch different things that I do, everybody has different quirks, different manners, and sometimes different incantations. I mean, I, I, I'm i a ridiculous studier and prepper because I love to live a character. I'll get off book with the lines months before, and then I kind of develop who they are and how they move, and as I get closer and closer, I kind of start to feel like I'm more. And um, and then the hard thing actually is putting that down afterwards, you know, because you kind of forget how you would handle things, and you start to think more of how that character would handle things. And that way, when you're watching, because I don't like watching actors, I like watching people live. Mm-hmm. And that way, you go on her journey and you feel her journey because she's actually going on that journey for the first time. Oh, wow. So that's kind of my method. Hey, I'm gonna uh, ask you to help me a little bit here by uh, saying hi to my moderators. Just say hi, go Cubs, and then hi, my <laughs> guests, hi, Brian, and hi, the rolling. Okay, hi, go Cubs. <laughs> yeah. He's got the longest handle in the world. It's go Cubs 2017 MLB, MLB season. He's basically so he's a ball player. Uh, he's a Chicago <laughs> or Cubs. A watcher. Right, right, right. And uh, and then there's Brian Guidry, who's uh, another one, and there's other people on here who haven't made themselves available. Hey, folks, you have questions for Tracy about being a sci-fi actress along the lines of the uh, some of the greats. I mean, I, like Gal Gadot is, I think, the latest one. Just just fire away. But tell my tell them also what the storyline is. Again, I mean, you said. Just one more time for those who are just chiming in. What's Rogue Warrior, Rogue, Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter about? It's about that time in the future where artificial intelligence is actually taking over our worlds. Mm-hmm. And if you look at our lives now, I mean, how many people do you see on the street that are holding a cell phone eight inches from their face? I mean, that's artificial intelligence. So everything that surrounds us is slowly taking over. And it's just about that in the future when when they've taken over everything, and they're they're attacking the worlds. And so my char- my character sets out to put an end to that because everybody's kind of a little bit complacent about it and just fighting their own territories, not realizing that if they go get certain weapons that are at different planets, that they can put an end to this. And so um, Sienna starts to gather her team and her people and breaks her boyfriend out of prison and this, that, and the other thing, and and, and all the things that happen along that journey. Hey, um, two of my, mm-hmm. my guests have questions. One of them is uh, from Go Cubs. He says, is it fun being in sci-fi films? I'll take that one first. It's the most fun. Like, I, as you know, I have a comedy coming out the next month, and I do comedy, I do drama and everything, but... Sci-fi is my genre. I mean, I grew up with it. My dad and I sat and ate rock road ice cream when I was a little girl and watched Star Trek, you know, and and so I always wanted to be involved to this degree. And my imagination is ridiculous, you know. It's like so for me, it's it's a natural progression. But what I love about this is it's character-driven sci-fi. So I get to use the other aspects of myself in order to create this really, really interesting character. And then Brian Guidry asks, he says, Tracy, can you tell me about courting chaos? And how it came to be. It's wickedly original and hilarious. <laughs> um, Courting Chaos was um, Kevin Coleman is a really good old friend of mine, and he asked me to come be a part of that. And it is a horror film, so to speak. And um, it's about these teenagers out at Blood Lake, and they're looking for the mystery of Blood Lake. And 
Barry Corbin and myself and a guy named Alan Petrusky are basically the story unfolds as we sit around in a bar, ex, you know, and Barry's explained to us the legend of Blood Lake. Wow. So is that? Oh, Brian did your watch. He writes again. He goes writes hi. Hilarious. <laughs> how, can, how can we see that today? Is it on YouTube or Netflix or is it on theaters or? It's been out on DVD for I think several years now. So oh, yeah, okay. you can get your hands on that. Yeah. So, so folks, go to DVD and get Courting Chaos, starring Tracy. Oh, Burton. I was doing Dawn of the Crescent Moon. Dawn of Courting the Courting Chaos. Um, <laughs> I know they all roll in together. They actually their premieres were back to back, night to night. Uh huh. So, Courting Chaos was a film um, about a journey of a gal that became a clown. She started out as a model and then she became a clown. I have a, a very small cameo in that, but it was actually quite a funny movie. Yeah. Wow. It's how many movies have you been in, Tracy? Why? <laughs> my God, I was looking at your IMDb and I thought, my goodness, she has played in a. Uh, quite a few roles. I mean, what what got you into acting to begin with? How did, yeah. Um, as a child, I watched a lot of TV, what was available, and it was always my idea to involve the entire neighborhood to reenact everything from the Partridge family to, you know, Nancy Drew, and I was always the lead, and I'd cast my neighborhood friends because I was the oldest of this group, <laughs> and I just love, I love taking on characters. And so then I studied musical theater growing up because it was the only outlet that I had. And then when I was 15, I did my first union commercial, which was Sun Kiss Soda. Oh, and I've been in the industry ever since, studying and working on characters and studying people. And then I'd say over the last seven or eight years, I've pretty much worked consistently and constantly. You mean, yeah. you mean like you're sad, you're sad, sad, right? Screen actors. I was sad at 15. Wow. Yeah. My yeah. Gosh. A few years ago. How are, how have things changed with, I have to ask, I'm dying to ask this question, how have mm -hmm. things changed with new media and everything? Because, you know, we're, we're doing new media, basically. But are mm -hmm. things better for actors and actresses, or worse, or the same, but different? What do you think? You know, I can't really talk on a general term. Like, like I have a lot of friends that complain about all the new media and the new rules and, this and how hard it is to get work, especially as a white woman. There's very few roles for white women right now. Really? But... To me, that's kind of like when we were kids, and it's like, oh, life's not fair because you're a woman. I, I was always raised just to think about what was right around me, and for me, whether you know, you're a man or a woman has always been equal opportunity. No matter what color you are, I think there's equal opportunity. You have to create your own world. Yeah. And yeah. every time I finish a project, I've got another one that I'm getting ready to do. So, so I don't understand all those cliches and all those things people are saying because they don't seem to pertain to me, and I don't compete with anybody else. I just keep doing my thing. It's funny you said because, like, I mean, I don't live here anymore. I live in California, but it's it's like you'll hear black folks say, "Oh, it's hard to get roles if you're black," or mm -hmm. yeah, it's everybody. It's so I don't know if that means it's equal because everybody's complaining, or I don't or what. <laughs> that's, that's that's crazy. But uh, yeah, you know, everything seems to be ethnically ambiguous these days. But yeah. I can sit around and I can think about that, and then I'll be throwing negative energy into the universe, and then I won't be working. Or I can just keep reading scripts and doing the next character, and not think about what color I am, what sex I am, what you know. It doesn't matter to me. Hey, do you it's, think that, <laughs> uh, having said that, do you think that new media presents opportunities for people to sort of like, there's this DIY movement, do it yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And do you? Because I see, for example, there was at Comic Con, Star Trek Anax Center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, have you all thought about doing things more along those lines and just putting them on YouTube and saying, hey, Zin, you know, let's just push this out there for us and, and all your other new media friends and all that? We, we'll, you get, know, we'll, we'll get you a lot of really things. Because at the end of the day, we have to make a profit. Right. At the end of the day, we have to make money and we have to be able to afford our bills and things like that. So so we have to make product that fits, fits into the niche of that which is selling. Oh, yeah. And, and so that's really, you know, I mean, new media is great if you're trying to get your face out there, you're trying to get your idea picked up on and stuff. But, but we have a pretty good flow and a pretty good track record. And um, so it isn't something that's good for us, but for a lot of other people, it's fabulous. And, you know? and Go Cub says that Nancy Drew is his favorite character. I want to ask you, you mentioned you're a Star Trek fan. Pardon? You mentioned you just watched Star Trek coming up, rather, right? Yes. What's your favorite episode? Tribbles. The trouble. The, the trouble with the tribbles. That's everybody's favorite. That that's. 
Uh, it, and I always go back to Logan's run in films. I'm just, for some reason, that really latched on to myself at that age. What? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. That was one of my favorite films. Yeah, me I, too. I just watched it again not even like six months ago. Because I like to go back and rewatch things and see how they affect me at different stages of my life. Uh-huh. And it still affects me. So if we if we remade Logan's Run, what character would you want to play and how would you want to redo it? I never want to redo a character. I'd want there to be a new character that I got to create. I don't ever want to copy anybody else's work. Uh-huh. Like, you find that Sienna, they compare her to a lot of other characters, but then the... The reviewers that came to the first screening that we had, they're like, oh, that's like a whole new character. And it's, it's, that's the fun to me, is spending those months and those hundreds of hours creating something that nobody's seen before. Huh. You know? People are going yeah. nuts. They're like, Logan's Run, that's my favorite. Oh. <laughs> it is. It's amazing. <laughs> Logan's Run, what I liked about it was the concept, because my background's in urban planning. And so mm -hmm. the whole concept of the dome city and the world that you create in it, that, that just, to this day, captures my imagination. And I always yeah. thought that at this time now we're going to be in dome cities and that sort of thing. You know, it just hasn't happened. But, I, mm -hmm. I, hey, talk about some of the other people that you play with in Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter. Because it looks like you've got a great stable of actors and actresses. You know what's great about this film is, is I got to have a lot to do with casting. And so I love working with other actors that love to live their roles. I don't like to work with actors that, you know, act, mm -hmm. um, that perform. And, and so each and every actor, we got to know them really well before. We saw their audition, then we would talk to them as a human being, and then Neil would actually rewrite the role once they were cast, mm -hmm. which is really, really interesting. Um, so, of course, there's Daz Crawford from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., great guy, great actor. Um, Stephen Manley, who was young Spock um, in Star Trek III, yep. brilliant actor, just absolutely brilliant. He's actually in the Time War with us, too. He plays Adolf Hitler. What? Traveling through time, trying to rewrite history. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> talk about... Yeah, I got your tongue. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to hear more about that film, but is there anyone else you want to mention in the cast before we strip over? Because I'm dying to hear about this. Uh, William Kircher, who was the lead dwarf Biffer in the Hobbit trilogy. Mm -hmm. Brilliant actor. Um, Libby Steubenrock, who was young Anna in Frozen, played young Annika. Huh. Fantastic. I mean, everybody that we worked with, I can actually say they were amazing. You know, Aaron Jacques is Tycho. Brilliant. Marilyn Gigliotti from Clerks. Great. I mean, so it's just it's just such a great experience because when you show up and you're working with other actors like that, nobody's got their paper in their hand, nobody's carrying on. Everybody's just the camera rolls and you start living it. And that's that's magic. That's when magic happens. And I gotta ask you too, did you come away with any like I gotta go to the hospital bumps and bruises? Because there was one scene where you to add this machine gun or some sort of device and you rammed up against this wall trying to either I think in, in, in combat against this flying android what was going on with that and did, did you get scarred from that every single day that I shot action on this film I got hurt wow and, um, and I would take pictures of it and rub it in arnica and go to bed at night and get up and do it again the next morning and if I had a limp or something it just became part of the character and um, I took pictures of everything I would always make jokes oh, at making oh, a book oh, called War yeah. Wounds you know yeah. so yeah I got really really I have scars I got badly injured many times lots of scrapes and the only bad thing is when a scene would get cut because the movie was so long in post and I'd be like, really, I got that injury from that, and you're going to cut that scene, you know? So, <laughs> but it's worth it, you know? If, if you're going through that and your character gets a little tattered, I mean, the exhaustion was more of it and the amount of food I had to consume to do all of this. Um, but it's part of the journey of the character, so you're more than happy to live it and to go through that with it. Well, nice. Now, yeah. like Ryan Guidry asks, are you going to be at San Diego Comic-Con? Excuse me, San Jose Comic-Con. Oh, we don't have any plans to go to San Jose right now because we're so hard at work at the end of the Time War, which is really the biggest science fiction thing I've seen in a long time. Now, which <laughs> opens the door to the next question. Tell us about the Time War. Okay, the Time War is um, a time travel film. 
and it's about Hitler going back through time in order to rewrite history, in order to change things and to modify himself. And my character is Dion in this, and what's interesting is there's about 20 different versions of Dion, and they're all different. And so it was really hard to kind of get my mind around what was different about each of them and how they were different, because, you know, they're from different timelines. And um, it was really, really exciting. And Barry Corbin's in that, and um, William Kircher makes an appearance in that too. Stephen Manley as Hitler, Aaron Jacques again as Jesus Christ. Um, wait, 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 what? <laughs> yes. Where in Expletive Deleted does Jesus Christ come in in this film? You're going to have to watch this. Oh, movie. I knew you were going to say that, Tracy. <laughs> Who wrote this? Is this it's fantastic. Um, this is like Neil Johnson's pet project that he's been working on for over 15 years. And then we finally started filming it a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago. And it's changed. It's morphed. Because we actually shot principal photography before we shot Rogue Warrior. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then his mind just kept going. And we you know, added scenes and added characters. And then we shot three weeks in England just a couple months ago. So we shot at Winchester Cathedral, we shot out at Avebury, we shot at um, Portsmouth and on submarines. and I mean, it's a big epic film. Brian Guidry says, this sounds like a South Park episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd love it if South Park would make an episode about that. That would be really good for marketing. Can you put that out there? <laughs> Tell people. We'll do that. <laughs> hey, folks, if you're on Twitter right now, tweet out. So tweet that, tweet that out. I will when this is done. <laughs> hey, so what... Uh, I got, obviously, I guess you can't get away too much of it, but we've got, well, I'm curious, how does Hitler, are we talking about he gets old and he discovers time traveling? I know we have to film the film, but can you give us a little bit of a schmidgen of a hint there? It's, it's really, it's a, it's a tasty movie. The storyline is just tasty. Well, you know, World War II movie, movies are kind of big right now, too. Yeah. Um, well, imagine, because you know you do know that Adolf Hitler did study time travel and had built a contraption and was very interested in time travel. Actually, so, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's really interesting because a lot of research went into his life in actually involving that in his character. Whoa. So imagine that he did figure out time travel and he could go back and genetically modify himself to be, you know, more, more intelligent, better looking, more you know, just everything, and imagine what would have happened in our world, okay? Now there's, and so now, there's that, some, now there's some people who would say he went forward in time, but I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> so but, it's a really interesting concept where it's very sci-fi, but there's also a lot of, um, there's some truths in it, yeah, and then yeah. there's also, um, again, my character setting out to... Um, to take him out, which is really, it's, it's, it's a fascinating film. I mean, to be honest, until it got into post, and he, Neil would keep writing these additional scenes and these additional characters, I could not get my head around it. So all I had to get my head around was what that version of me was doing in that scene. Wow. And now wow. as I'm seeing it unravel in post-production, I'm like, how did you think of that? <laughs> Why does this sound like the time machine meets Inglorious Bastards? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah. It, it's 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 interesting. It's really really interesting. Yeah. Now, is there a website where people could check it out? And because give us a date to to find out. I want first interview. I want to know. I want. I want. I want everything. I want everything. <laughs> As you do. Yes. Um, do. about four months till it's finished. It's four months. Pre sales are at Con are at Can right now, but um, so some of the poster artwork's done and stuff. But we haven't released that to the public yet. So I will actually send you a message when all of that is available online. You can catch little bits of it on IMDb, but we're kind of trying to keep it on the download because it is such a big deal to us. Okay, so where are your next appearance is going to be? I know you we, off camera we were talking about Comic-Con San Diego, but that was kind of not certain yet. Uh, if I fit it in, Comic-Con San Diego is one of my favorite things. I absolutely adore it. And... Um, Besides that, right now the only thing planned, except for you know appearances and stuff like with you, is um, June second opening night of the film. We have a big opening night thing happening at Downtown Independent. Wow! So that's when you can start catching the film at the theaters. It plays during the day too, but we're doing the opening night oh, thing at down, night. Downtown LA, Downtown 
at, yeah. the, at the independent. Okay, yeah, just to make sure for those of you who might be in someplace other than Los Angeles, she's talking about Los Angeles, downtown independent. It, it'll be in the trades and stuff advertised when the show times are, but we'll be at the opening night for that. Wow. And are there t shirts and posters that one can get online? Oh, and uh, Brian has a question. He says, Tracy, what passion project do you want to see completed? And what dream role or director would you like to have or work for? Oh, gosh. Question. I mean, any question. of the greats, really. Um, there's so many of them. You know, George Lucas, who knows what he's doing? He's seen us. There's so many of them that have passed away is the sad thing that I wanted to work with, you know. Yeah, uh -huh. Anything Stanley Kubrick-esque or Quentin Tarantino, I mean, I like the great minds that think way outside of the box. And that's what's fun about the Time War. And even Rogue Warrior is that they're really, they're, they're pretty far out of the box. And the dream role for me is anything I haven't done before that pushes me to even new lengths, which... To tell you, at the time war, it's the first film I've ever ended up in the emergency room over. I was had so much anxiety over these characters. Oh, no. I'm like, if I'm under any more pressure, I'm going to stroke out, right? Uh -huh. And so one morning I woke up, my heart was pounding because of things I've been through, the torture I've been through emotionally. And so I actually called 911, and, and I'm here in my stormtrooper pajamas in the back of an ambulance, you know. <laughs> and all they did, they did scans and stuff. They're like, no, you're fine. They gave me an Ativan. I think I took two of those. And then I went to go do three more weeks of shooting in England. <laughs> so I have things that really, that really push me, you know. I, I, that's the type of... Of performances that I enjoy doing. I like comedy too. I mean, I have two comedies coming out this year, but that's more of a dance. That's like recovery stuff. Oh, by, you know, by, that's fun. By the way, before I, because I'm already carried away. How much? How much of your time do I have left? How? How? How much? Uh... Um, we can keep talking. I'm just going to my parents when I'm done. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so, you mentioned. Okay. Is there a possibility of a sequel for Rogue Warrior? More than a possibility, um, we're planning a TV series spin-off of Rogue Warrior. Ooh. And, yeah, so because TV is kind of the way of the future right now, and everybody likes to binge watch and everything. One of the main things all the critics said after watching Rogue Warrior is like they didn't want it to be over. They wanted to see where it went next, you know. So we got approached by a company. We have not done a deal with them yet because we're still looking at exactly how we want to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, that's definitely next on the table as soon as the time war is finished. Oh, and Brian Geary wants to know if you have a sister. <laughs> are, are you single? <laughs> Two sisters. Two sisters. <laughs> Two sisters. I so love that you asked that. <laughs> and you're actually, a, I mean, she doesn't look like, she. well, she has a wife, she's a wife and a mom, right? Wait. You're, I thought your wife and a mom, right? No? No. You're not? <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, I can't. Uh, <laughs> My kids are grown, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Folks, she's only 26. So, anyway, there you go. <laughs> but what, if you, I mean, as, 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 as we talk about science fiction, one thing that I've noticed is that more programs are becoming uh, dystopian. And why do you think that is? I mean, you know, where they're, they're gritty and there's always like this end of the world sort of thing, or in the case of Rogue Warrior, it's the robots taking over. You know, I can think of all these different examples. Why? Why is it negative? Why is it so scary? I don't think that that's negative, to be honest. I mean, I think about my childhood and dealing with the science fiction that I watched, and oh, this could happen, and oh, that can happen. What does that do? That makes our minds work. That makes us think about what we can do to solve problems in the future. It makes us think outside the box. I mean, whoever thought we'd be talking on cell phones, Star Trek did. You know, Doctor Who did. I mean, Inspector Gadget even. You know, we had all these little things. We actually have those now. I think science fiction is, ma is mainly written by people that are genius mm -hmm. and that they can see where things might be going and what we might have in the future. And so for me, it's what are the possibilities of what could happen and what are the things that we could start thinking about now in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so I think it's an intelligent, I think science fiction draws intelligent people and people that like to imagine, people who like to dream, and people that like to think outside the box on what we can do to better our futures. Like, I love the whole idea of genetic modification of humans with robots. I love that whole concept of integrating the two. Is so, that, 
Is that? Oh, oh, Go Cubs has a quick question. He says, "Would you ever want to be in a Disney or Pixar film, since they are such huge companies?" Well, now you always want to work with a big company. Somebody's got to pay the bills. Um, but at the same time, yeah, because Disney and Pixar have good character arcs again. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's character. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's a collaboration between people. So I don't think you can ever say no to anything because you never know when you're going to get that great script that you're just dying to live. Now. I was going to ask, going back to what we were talking about as far as uh, storylines, do you think that the interest, as you say, in genetic modification with respect to humans and robots is really a, an offshoot of immortality? You know, people wanting to live forever, never never pass on, that sort of thing. Does it matter? Um, yeah, if we're looking, it does. If we're... It does. Did you said you asked me. Yes, it matters. I told you that I, my world revolves around with the possibilities that I might be faced with, and I try not to compare myself and my thoughts with other people. Mm -hmm. But do I think it's cool that we have lasers and we can be kept younger? Yes. Do I think that if we eat right and exercise, that life can last longer? Yes. Do I think that we can at some point be somewhat genetically modified so that we can have happier, healthier futures? And maybe live longer and get to enjoy our loved ones more and this, that, and the other thing. I think that's fabulous. Um, am I afraid of dying? No. You know, so it's like, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. that's kind of the whole thing. It's like I think about what it is that I'm faced with. And I want to be a better me. And I want to live long but healthy. And if I die, which I'm not afraid of, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what's next. I'm not afraid. I mean, there's so many possibilities out there, you know? See, I guess you're better than me. I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I look. I'm a I'm a Christian. I don't I don't go to, I don't go to church like I should. I believe that Christ died to save us from our sins. But I and that's supposed to make you not afraid of death. But hey, what can I say? I am. And but that said, you know, I accept the fate. But the idea of us being melded with machines makes me wonder if we're going to or. I'll, I'll go a step further. I would argue that we already are, to a degree, losing our humanity. I mean, just walking down the street, not interacting with people, interacting with a you know a cell phone, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, I think you and I can talk because we're the same generation. We remember a no, time, right? <laughs> well, look, I my last girlfriend was twenty eight, so that's not a problem, okay? My problem is is, is but I remember a time when. Mm -hmm. We didn't have these things, and yeah. you could you you talking to somebody was an easy thing to do. And now, talking to someone, some people act like it's an intrusion just to say something to them. And I'm just like, whoa, wh where are we going? It just seems nuts to me. And I blame the machines for that. You know, I, I just I, or did you watch Saturday Night Live last night by chance? No, you? I didn't. Oh, no. it was amazing with The Rock, and he had a segment mm -hmm. on where he made this robot that, I don't want to say what the robot did, I'll leave it to you finding out on Twitter or something like that, but it was like, I was I was watching my mom who I'm visiting, my viewers know, and I said to mom, D did I just hear what I thought I heard? And the whole point is that someone thinks a robot can be made to do that. And I'm thinking, oh, where are we going with this? That's why I wonder, I, I, I yearn for that, and I think at some point, I'm going on. I'm, going, I'm violating my rule. I'm starting to talk more than you. What do you think about what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's go back to the first part. And I'll give you my. I was. I was. I was raised. You know, Christian. I went to five different churches because I love to sing. Oh, and by the way, so, my, Brian says he's 33 and he feels the same way as I do. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I sang in a Lutheran church, a Presbyterian church. I went to a Catholic school. I sang in a Baptist church, which was my favorite, by the way. Yeah. And. You know, I think that Christianity does teach us to be afraid of death because we're, we're believing in something and we're assuming that we know where it's going, and that's fearful to us. Yeah. So I have a multidimensional way of thinking of things. I look at religion and its existence and, and what it is, and I look at science and its existence and what it is. I also can look at, you know, science fiction and metaphysical things, and you think, whatever's out there, we're not afraid of. Right? right? It's like the only thing that scared me was when I was a kid and I went to church all the time and they told me this is going to happen to you when you die. <laughs> <laughs> 
So once I stopped believing in man-made religion and not what the Bible said or the Quran said or the Doctrine and Covenants or any of that, once I started thinking for myself and, and reading books and thinking, okay, these are examples, these are stories, but the rules are all made by man, and those things can scare the living bleep out of you. Yeah. And so for me, I do believe that religion is behind people living in fear and living in rules rather than listening inside and figuring out what it is that they're supposed to do next with their lives and being accepting of all different people. Because when we're told to do things as human beings, we automatically have a little resentment towards that. So we're being told all these things that we have to do that some church leader long ago read the book and said, well, because of this, you have to do this, that, and the other thing. And it envelops fear in people, and fear is isolating, and fear is, um, you know, it makes you not think for yourself. It makes you not listen inside. So just take everything that's out there and live a happy life and be a good you and do the best that you can be, and that's kind of how I look at it. So I'm not afraid of the machines as long as we keep them under wraps. <laughs> I like the way you look at it. I'm gonna, in fact, while I'm talking to you, I'm gonna tweet this out uh, single-handedly here, and uh, because I think I have more Twitter followers than other people anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, so having said that, would you, if you were in a Star Trek role, I'm, 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 I'm curious to ask, uh, what would the dream? And hey, Rod Roddenberry may, may see this, so keep keep in mind. <laughs> or you, and he has a new TV show out that he's involved with called Star Trek Discovery on uh-huh. on CBS and CBS All Access. So mm-hmm. my question to you is, what? Um, uh, yeah, my question to you is, what Star Trek character or what would you like to be in Star Trek? You know, like I said before, I don't want to be anything that's already been done before. But they're very good about that as they do the new Star Treks, you know, as as opening it up. I always wanted to be bald and blue, but nobody's doing that anymore. So I missed my my opportunity for that. Um, Something strong, something commanding with vulnerabilities. You know, I could be a a captain, but she's got it. I love anything that was strength and vulnerability wrapped in together because that's a beautiful thing to watch, whether it's me or whether it's somebody else, you know. Anything that's challenging and anything that nobody else wants to do, that's usually what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, my mom and I were talking about the actor Montgomery Cliff because that was Montgomery Cliff was her favorite actor. Who was your favorite actor coming up? You or know, um, I don't really remember from when I was a kid because I, I kind of just studied everybody. But lately, um, Daniel Day Lewis is one of my favorites. He lives everything. Um, lately, um, Leonardo DiCaprio and The Revenant. I could watch that movie over and over and over again. And I, I was not that thrilled with his performances when he was younger, but so, something finally clicked inside of him where he just lives it to the fullest. And I just love that. I'd love to, I'd love to do a movie like that. Could try and survive out in the snow and practically die. I would love that. Um, and then Meryl Streep, although I was not that fond of her most recent one, Ricky and the something. Can't remember where she played the band member, the aging band member. Right, right. I remember. I remember the movie. It's in my head. Flash. Right. Ricky and the Flash. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. No, it wasn't that. She didn't get. You know, she she didn't get the right material on that in order to make it something that the viewers really wanted to watch. But that's the kind of actors that I like. You know, the ones that really live and breathe what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Brian asks, is, "Do you have any advice for a parent to a four-year-old with a vivid imagination?" <laughs> <laughs> Do not stifle it. <laughs> There you go, Brian. Do not stifle it right there. <laughs> now we've got. I'm gonna, in, in, out of respect for your time, I'm gonna let you go at uh, at four thirty my time, which is about uh, seven minutes to say something like that. Yeah, okay. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, but I want to just say that it's cool to be able to interview, particularly for this long, someone who's a science fiction star. Mm-hmm. And who's doing so much incredible work, and um, who gets to pick their characters, and I, you know, do you have a production company of your own? If somebody's watching this, they want to invest in you. I mean, is that in the offing, or are you? you yeah, know? I mean, I have a production company. I mean, usually people just want me to be in their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, my stuff's all online and IMDb and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's there's some pretty great things coming out in our future pretty quick. And 
And it's really funny. I was talking to a gal this morning in New York, and she says, um, well, you know, something about being a woman and being over 30 and this, that, and the other thing. And, and I said, who makes the rules? What we have, everybody wants to watch. I don't believe in rules. You know, I believe that you make something that the people want to watch, and then you pour your heart and your soul into it. Right. And I believe that what comes next will follow, you right. know? Right. Brian asks, has there, has there been any role you missed out on that you regret or think you would have done better at? Mm, out, of politeness, I'll, out of politeness, I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> there hasn't been really anything that I missed out on. I did get to um, audition for a Star Trek once when I was in my 20s, and, and I didn't get it. And I was bummed about it. But usually if I try for something, I haven't auditioned in years, but if I would try for something in my developing years and I didn't get it, I was still excited because somebody wanted to see me perform. Yeah. So I was never that bummed out. It's like, oh, I got to do all the prep work. I got to find the character. I got to grow as an actress. And they went with somebody else. They might be, you know, a different color, a different age, a different hair color, anything. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I'm more thankful of the offices that I got called into because those characters all helped me develop into the person I am today where I feel like I can take any character given the amount of time and knock it out of the park. I mean, I just, I, I put that kind of work in. It isn't, it's not ego. It's, I realize what I'll put into it. Brian says, I thought he thought you were still 26. Wink, wink. And also, I love you, Brian. <laughs> you look like Tara Reed too, you know, who, uh, Tara, who became a star in Sharknado. I mean, you ever get mistaken for her? No. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. I was looking because I I have, in fact, I have two Tara Reid stories from Comic-Con. The first one was I was walking down. You know where the Hard Rock Hotel is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was walking past that, and there's this side door that people come out of, I guess, when they, I guess when they go to some meeting, uh, whatever, the celebrities come out of that side door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tara Reid came out right in front of me mm -hmm. with a group. I mean, like, when I say right in front of me, like three feet in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I just started, for, I will start walking with a group. <laughs> I had no idea where they were going. I walked seven blocks with them. They had no <laughs> idea I was behind them. And part of that's on video. <laughs> just, yeah. And the other one. You know, I never saw Sharknado. I saw the trailer for it because I met the writer at, a casting director friend's birthday party. So I, I did watch the trailer and it looked funny, but I never got around to watching it. Yeah. Well, you know, you should be in Sharknado 5 because I've interviewed, I don't know how many people who were in Sharknado uh, uh, that, at Comic-Con and uh, they had their publicist people there, you know, last year and the fellow that played Cupcake in, they called him Cupcake in the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek and mm -hmm. he was, I he was in Sharknado, and so there's got to be a role for you in Sharknado. Like maybe somebody mistakes you for Tara Reid in Sharknado, right, or something mm -hmm. like that. I, I think that, <laughs> I think that would definitely. You're trying to throw me a non-challenging role here, Zenny. <laughs> well, it's, but it would be so fun, you know. It would be like, I mean, what's life? What's life? If you can't do a fun one, you know, role once in a while. It's kind of like, ah, eh, whatever, right? I got to do two really fun ones this year, and it's funny because I look back at them, and it's like, they were like, the, you know, both Who's Jenna and then this other one that I did in Australia, and I just kind of laugh when I think about them. They're fun, and they're marketing them and everything, but but what really drives me as an actor is is the deep stuff, you know? Yeah. Brian Guidry says, no Sharknado. I'm going to be yeah. your agent, and we're getting the Flash movie or Batgirl movie role. Yeah, I see. There we go. There you go. <laughs> I think I think Brian's trying to move himself in line to be your agent. So. <laughs> well, hey, this has been fantastic. I'm gonna let you go because I know you've got a uh, busy Sunday ahead with your folks. And yes. uh, this has been a lot of fun, though. We got to do this again, especially because you have to tell me more about Hitler and Jesus oh, yes. Christ. Lots more coming out on that soon. As soon as I have something I can show you, I will. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you'll be pretty amazed. I'm amazed, and I was in it. I just couldn't see the overview until it started going into post. It was so complicated. It, you know. It, it, oh, and is there a website for it, by the way? No, nope. the only thing you can find in it right now is on IMDb, or you can Google it. There's some stories out on it. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. definitely. And folks, this <laughs> is uh, now the third video of a playlist. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna make called. 
Tracy Birdsall interviews Zenny62.com. Hey, you have a you have a there's a shadow over there. You have a company with somebody, right? So somebody is that somebody's in the Chris, you want to say hi? Yeah. Bring him Director in. Director Johnson just got here, so hang on, what? I'll pop in. Hey Neil, how you doing? It's Zinny. How you doing? Hey. Wait a minute. Do we have wait a minute? Don't I ah oh, shoot. I want uh, Oh, because you've got that cropping thing going. Oh. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to crop anything. I wanna <laughs> I, we were gonna I, now I gotta stick around and talk some more. Neil, tell us no. about Hitler. <laughs> You, you funny you should ask that question. Yeah, I, I cannot leave. I'm sorry. Uh, do you mind? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is, keep going. Keep okay. going. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I was trying to be a gentleman and respect her time and everything. And you're here. And I, dude, you're, folks, this man is the genius. I'm sorry. He just is it, you know? So uh, we met at Comic Con last year. Fantastic. And I'm going to shut up. Tell my viewers about Hitler, Jesus Christ, and time travel. I just well, it, it's funny. We're right in the middle. Right? The um, the editor and myself are working through this scene uh, right now. Where uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm bamboozled right now. So here's what happens in this scene, and it'll probably change. But these uh, giant flying subs appear, these mm -hmm. submarines, mm -hmm. and you know, there's uh, Tracy's character Dion's on there with you know some other people. And they start opening fire in these tanks that are, that are driving past Stonehenge. And on top of one of the tanks is Adolf Hitler Whoa. and his army. And he's got like these uh, <laughs> robots behind him. And, and they're basically taking on, they're taking on um, this giant flying submarine. There were three of them over the ocean. And two of them get blown up. And the last one takes off and flies off because Hitler has all the tanks and, you know, he's, he's got an army of tanks. Holy, and to put this holy, holy, holy special effects. That's all I got to say. I have to tell you, you now have more information than anybody else out there. I'm blessed. No, this is like, my, <laughs> Brian's going, my viewers going nuts. He's like, he's, and they're all like, and they're, they're increasing. This is huge. I mean, uh, how are you going to do that scene? That's, that's a complicated scene, uh, Neil. Well, I mean, well, here's how, here's how we've done it, and we're still in the process of putting it together. That's why I came here to ask Tracy about some, you know, extra footage. He yeah. wants to hurt me in some way again. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so <laughs> I'll explain the breakdown of this. So we, we uh, in England, we shot uh, the White Cliffs of Dover, you know, with a, with a helicopter thing. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, no, it was a drone, sorry. Shot White, White Cliffs of Dover, so that's one side, and the ocean over England is the other side of the background plates. Then in the desert, we shot these, uh, we actually had, had physical tanks, uh, not, not CG tanks. We shot tanks in the desert mm -hmm. uh, and then shot those tanks again on green screen. And blew them up. And then we shot Adolf Hitler in, in Las Vegas. Uh, then we shot the elements of Tracy Birdsall in Malibu. Um, then there's some other soldier stuff was shot in England as well on green screen. Uh, the stuff at Winchester Cathedral. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that's that's yeah. gnarly stuff. But I mean, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's all these little elements. I'm trying. We're in the middle of putting these together, and it's so complicated. And you know, there's actually three countries involved. <laughs> what is? I gotta ask. What is Adolf Hitler doing in Las Vegas? Well, that's where the actor was living. <laughs> <laughs> long story it was a pickup shot that we had to do and he couldn't leave his hometown for some reason so we had to actually go there to do the pickup shot and, and that's Stephen Manley from Star Trek he, he played uh, young Spock in Star Trek 3 and he does this most amazing Adolf Hitler amazing. like I mean I've I'm we started watching uh, a lot of the Hitler movies yeah you know, we saw Alec Guinness playing Hitler and we mm -hmm. saw Bruno Gantz playing Hitler, mm -hmm. and you know some of the great portrayals of Hitler. And Stevens um, is better. I, I, yeah, I'm going to say he's at least on the same level. Better? But I, wow. I think he's better because you know you, you kind of see these nuances in what you know the, the behind the scenes. Okay, you got the public Hitler, of course, and he does a great speech. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you get when the camera turns away, you know when when he turns away from the audience, and you see the private Hitler. Um, Stephen Manley just captures this so well, and I have never seen this on a film where you're seeing how he feels as a person inside. You know how how he's really haunted by demons and the pain of it all, and the you know the behind the scenes Hitler. You know the Hitler in the or dare I say in the bedroom in the you know the private halls of his sorry the private halls of his um, 
his costume. In this yeah, how did you costume. capture that? How did what did you read to get that essence of Hitler that we haven't seen much of? We, 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 studied him. He studied him. Oh, uh, I've been I've been studying a lot of it. You see, the interesting thing about Hitler is okay. In the last parts of the war, he was he was obviously on, he was whacked on drugs, and that's becoming a fact now <laughs> that he was on some sort of drug. Um, Lots of drugs. Yeah, I mean, he was on. Yeah. He was really oh. whacked. But but the thing was. There is so many transcripts of his private conversations in, in the end. You know, people were recording stuff like, you know, uh, his, um, oh, God, his uh, his secretary, you know, and their, their private, his personal assistant. You know, he had a Jesus Christ fixation and really thought that he was going to become like Jesus Christ. Whoa. And that's where that tie-in comes Whoa. from. Yeah, and that's yeah. why in this film, you know, he's traveling through time, and he, I mean, we opened the film. I don't think that's it. I didn't know that because the, the 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 most the most familiar I am with the Third Reich is a book uh, by Albert Speer. It's called yes. Inside the Third Reich, which I have, and I read I read when I was seven years old. And you would say, oh. why would I read it when I was seven years old? Uh, my interest, as I said, the trade has always been urban planning since I was a little boy. And if you want to learn something about urban planning from a standpoint of what's called solid solidity and and multi-generational lasting you read inside the third reich because oh, like you know because hitler was interested in having a lasting uh, civilization that lasted the generations right well, you know? that, yeah that's true you even you go to berlin now it, it's i have to be honest despite the fact that you know my my grandfather uh flattened the city <laughs> You that's know? true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, seriously. No, I, uh, no it's, it's, there's some irony it's, there, though, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's funny because you know my grandfather was in the air force. Mm -hmm. He's passed away, but he he was, I believe he was. He didn't talk about it much. He had something to do with the bombing of Dresden, mm -hmm. and you know that was a beautifully artistic city. And, and I, I dare I say the shame about it. The um, you know it, it didn't sit well with him. You know, war doesn't sit well with anybody. Right. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also looking at you know the core of what what Hitler was as a person and why, and trying to understand his backstory, and you know his whole hatred of the Jews. He had a he had a young girl, a 16 year old girl, he was madly in love with, who broke his heart at the age of 15 or 16. Who was a this Jewish girl. Hmm. So we're actually pulling on those. Um, pulling on his real life and yeah, creating yeah. a story. You know, so, I was telling him about the time travel machine he was building and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, well, well, the Nazis yeah. were thought silly, you know, foolishly that they were trying to, in, in they, they built the uh, some sort of time travel technology, or they're trying to. It was pseudoscience, of course, but I'm basing on what if they succeeded? That's the premise of the film. Hey, can I offer a suggestion or? What would be fascinating to have as a component to this is maybe, and I don't know if you've earmarked these little research points, but to have mm -hmm. that as a website, you know, like I did, and I mean, like maybe just I did this here, here, and here, right? Well, it, we, you know. we planned a documentary uh, uh, on okay. this. Yeah. Uh, but, man, it's and, and so, so, it, so it becomes teachable. I mean, so some, someone yeah. can look at it, you can say, okay. And, they can research it. Right, right, yeah. right. And then it's good for history. You know, st students and everything else. I'm just plugging in the iPhone here. That's why. So that, that uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I, I mean, there, look, we, we, there is a lot of historical basis on this. And that's what we kind of, that, that's that's what makes a good story is the history of the Third Reich and the history of Hitler and why he did it and right. The, right. the horrendous things that he did to people. Um, but why? You know, it, it's not just because he was on a little bit of a religious you know, bent. He he was seriously wanting to take the place of Jesus Christ, and it was it was a valid point. Have and you, he was he created a religion, the society, you know, the the, the Thule uh, or Thule, however you pronounce it. Have you been that able to thing. Have you been able to pinpoint what turned him in this direction? In other words, when he became well, it's kind of like when Darth Vader became Darth Vader, right? Yes. When he became Hitler, when he turned. Well, okay, there was a couple of, a uh, few turning points. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his father died, obviously, when he was young. He was a little bit uh, mollycoddled by his mother, mm -hmm. Clark. And that was something, you know, so they always, or it immediately makes you into a bit of a, you know, self-obsessed person. Yeah. Uh, during World War One. now there's very interesting stuff, during, he served in World War One, mm -hmm. and his uh, his life was spared by a British officer, you know, who, who basically could have shot him and, and actually spared his life. And that was, I always felt that was in the beginning why he was always reluctant to, to, you know, really go after England. 
Um, obviously, he was forced into it because they were on the attack. But in the beginning, he, he had a lot of healthy respect for certain. He had respect for America. He had respect for England, though he did want to conquer both of them. Um, and he even had respect for France because of the beautiful architecture there. So he, he had some <laughs> semblance of something, but then the war machine took over. I think the turning point was he was uh, he, he was injured during World War I. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a mustard gas attack. Um, and he was, you know, posthumously, oh, not posthumously, he was uh, put off uh, serving in the war because of his injuries in World War One. So he's a bit of a small war hero. And that's how, that's how we show the turning point of the film. We open the film with, you know, he's hit by a mustard gas bomb or his bomb goes off and he has a vision, you know, from the mustard gas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it kind of starts the movie off, in, you know, on his journey of time travel as well. I mean, it's very quick how we get through it. So it's almost uh, he has this, so basically what you're telling is he has a sort of near death experience. Yeah. Then ignites that. That makes Wow. Uh, and he, he really did, you know. He yeah, really yeah. Did. right, right. Um, he writes about it, you know, in some of his memoirs. But I, I'm trying not to demonize him, even though he's one of the most, you know, evil people around. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to tell his story in a science fiction film. Yeah, let's understand who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he's not he's not the good guy in this movie. But you know, let's understand why. Right, and right, that, right. That then we understand ourselves because we're all capable of good and evil. Yeah, it's something that is fascinating to me is that because it's set in a science fiction way, you are opening up the material to students who normally wouldn't absorb it. Yeah. Because it's yeah. science. And that's what is so attractive to me, you know. And I mm. think that's why I think people, particularly in education, should be aware of what you're doing as a way of saying hey look as a way of introducing them to the subject matter in a way that no one else has because i don't this is quite path most, you know? most think, people you know, wouldn't pay any attention unless you delved into their curiosity by giving them some information yeah. you know we've had a lot of deep conversations in this interview yeah. today <laughs> I, I mean even in the film we had actual artifacts from world war ii some nazi items yeah. some real nazi items when you touch the history of it it's it's terrifying Oh, uh, I was so you know, chills you. I was so busy listening that I my my guest Brian will ask, "Are you going to introduce his love for the occult or extraterrestrial studies?" Uh, we touched on it. It's something I found fascinating about him. Uh, the extraterrestrial stuff was it was in an earlier draft, and I cut it out because I, his interest in the in the occult uh, was I, I guess a little bit more interesting than. We, we gloss over it because it's kind of showing, uh, you know, the, rea- the what what comes as, as a part of that. He was using the interest in the occult as as for the forming the base of the religion mm-hmm. of the Nazi Empire. So his uh, his interest in the occult and aliens and everything is it's kind of disappears pretty quickly. Once you travel through time, you can go back and find okay, here is Jesus, or here is this or that. Right. You can learn the truth about history. It kind of dissipates the interest in the occult. Yes, he had that interest in the occult in the beginning, uh, but it, it quickly moved away from that. I was so tempted to have aliens in this movie, but, you know, the, the, the danger is there's been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cartoony-type movies Just about so, Hitler. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. as a robot, as this, as that. And we're kind of trying to take a more serious bent on it. So if we go into the territory of aliens, then we become, you know, low rent sci-fi, which, you know, I, I don't want to be accused of doing anymore in my life. We, we want to get away from that. Even in Rogue Warrior, there was no cartoony to it. Like, people expect it to go there, and it doesn't. You know, it, it kind of rises above it with reality. Right. And, um, and that, that's the fun in doing it. A reality that's becoming more real every day. I mean, with, with the Lexa and everything else, but I digress. Question from my uh, Go Cubs. He asks, "What countries did you all go to film time travel?" Huh. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, places. Let's think. Uh, well, obviously England, a bit of Germany, uh, USA. Yeah, some in Wales. Yeah, a little bit in Wales, England. Little Scotland. Bit in Scotland. Uh, but see, it was in north of England, so a lot of it's in Yorkshire, believe it or not. Huh. Uh, some of it is in the south of England. We went to a town called Birdsall, which is where my family is from on my father's side, like 45 minutes from Yorkshire. And I don't know if it'll end up in the film, but we did take some footage there, which is kind of cool. There is stuff from, in, shot in Nuremberg, Germany. 
Yeah, so your your family took the name of the town as their name? I don't know if they took the name of the town or if the town took their name. I, I have to ask my father that question because somebody has asked me that. And, yeah. Yeah. and so we were talking, Neil, we walked in, we mentioned a sequel to Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter. Yeah, a TV series. TV series. Tell us when that's, how far along in production or pre-production that is. Uh, I, I put it all on hold until I finish the time war because, I, as I said, I'm, I'm in the middle of destroying, you know, <laughs> submarines. And we'll call it development at this point in time. But as soon as I'm done in about four months, I'm, I'm full, you know, head down, butt up, straight into, <laughs> into that film. It's not going to be exactly like uh, Rogue Worry. It's going to be a little bit more, um, um, you know, dare I say more, more fast and furious and out of space, you know, hand solo type thing. Um, but, but maybe Spinal Tap meets, uh, uh, I don't know, something, you know, it, it's, I, I like that. I, it's it's going to be like very that. entertaining and it's going to be fun, but it's going to be gritty and it's going to, it's going to be a little bit more Mad Max, uh, a little bit more Star Wars in places, a little bit less, you know, AI centric because we've explored that story and I don't want to just keep going for the same story. Yeah. It's going to be more direct, directed towards the evolution of humanity and stuff like that and how we survive an apocalypse and how we get up, you know, truly explore space with limited resources. Just a little bit of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because, you know, but eventually one of the characters will probably build a spaceship in their back garden or in their garage and, and fly into space. So, you know, that type of thing. And Neil, do you have a website where people can review all uh, your yes. work? Uh, www.empire.com, E-M minus or dash P hyphen, P-I-R-E.com. That's the easiest one, and it That's spreads right. out from there. The Empire wouldn't have anything to do with that whole Hitler idea, would it? No, no. No, he's had it for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I had it since... Uh, in some form or another since, I kind of think. Probably the beginning. Mid-90s, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, Brian, Gidry, so, Brian Gidry says, if you ever need a stuntman that'll work for free to get his foot in the door, he's available. Where does he live? <laughs> hey, Brian, where do you live? Because I have people all over. I even have fans in Germany and Australia. I have somebody in Octavio Arias is in Argentina. Where do you live, Brian? Hurry up. Cough it up. Brian. Mr. Gidry. You can type. He can message it later. He can message it later, Brian. Oh, it's uh, yes, we are always looking for stuff. San people. Jose. He lives in San Jose. Oh, he's, not oh, that's that far. A, he's, he's a local boy. He, yeah. can't do, he can't do my stunts, though. I get to do it. Ha, ha. <laughs> well, if you ever need, a, you ever need a, a bald headed black guy that looks like he's 26 but is 55 <laughs> and vlogs, you know, and I'm, in, I'm in good shape. So count me. I, I work out every day. So, you know, you just need to get in the background or something just looking stupid. Let as long as you can hold a gun, we're happy. Uh, I can hold. I can hold a gun. Yes, and shoot one. You know, have it's very few people know how to shoot a gun properly on camera. Let me tell you. I know how to hold a gun, but my mom shoots a gun better than I do. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. I'd like her. <laughs> my mom is awesome. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna let you guys go because I know you got work to do, and mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a treat. I mean, uh, this is by the way. This is all. It's also not only is it live. The minute it stops, it automatically goes out, and it goes out sixty times on Twitter, and on my blog. But I'm gonna write a special post because you came in in the middle, actually toward the end, Neil, and gave mm -hmm. us um, a lot of juicy information. I got to just sit down and write, and I think I'll just take that and break it out as a separate video. Kind of exclusive if yeah. you think yeah. about this it. Yeah, the first what person you know about what I'm it. Talking you about. may want to total. separate that out. Yeah, I, I, I may want to. Excuse yeah. me, like, yeah, I do want to. This is like I'm blessed. I'm not. But, stupid. Hey, I'm not that's just I've awesome. known you for a while now. Yeah, and I, my name is E Y. E Y. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't know why I keep doing weird. that. E Y. I'll call okay. me out. Call me out. Okay. <laughs> no, call me out. Call me out. I will. I will. I, I wish Cliff had told me. Oh well, I'll, I'll correct it. I'll correct it. <laughs> In fact, I'll correct it when it right now because when I the minute I press the like button, it'll do the autocorrect on everything that sends out. So that's oh, good. oh, thank you. Yeah, you had said it. You couldn't do it later. That's the only reason I called it out. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm happy to be called out. I think you did that last time too. <laughs> I don't know what I think. Is it Tracy? I don't know why I do the IE thing. I think it has 
a holdover to a girl I had a crush on, maybe. I, something, I you know, yeah. was, you know, we, we've all had a crush on a, a girl named Tracy with IE. It, or, or, <laughs> girl, or, or a girl with an IE in her name. Yeah. And it's always, EY was the way that they spelled it for boys. Either right. Y or EY. And so it, I had to kind of live that down for the first eight years of my life. Yeah. You know, well, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like how, what's her name spelled? Candy. Uh, with a C and the little A and the little D and they're like, right, yeah, you know, something like that. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you all so very much. This has been a treat and uh, a blessing. Thank you all so much. Great seeing you and again. Brian yeah, says you again. Thank you. And Brian yeah, says thank you. And everybody else, thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay. All right. I'll see you. Bye. Okay, see ya. See you. Bye. Okay, see ya. Hey, folks, thanks a lot. And we'll be back later for our standard live stream tonight uh zenny 62 on youtube at the standard time all right see you guys later okay see ya <laughs>